Hi, I thought I would talk about what it's like to be an Enneagram Type 5 and I'll include a link for a free test so you can see what your personality type is. And the reason why I like it is because it gives you constructive criticism on things that you need to work on. So it tells you your basic tendencies and strengths, but also tells you things that you need to work on, unlike the um, Myers-Briggs. Um, the Myers-Briggs just tells you, um, well, there's one link that does tell you some of your weaknesses and how you are in relationships, um, but I find Type 5 to be um, more helpful in what I know I need to do to grow as a person. And um, if you know yourself, if you're introspective, you know things that you tend to do and what kind of tips you off to be unbalanced in scales. So for me, when my seesaw is, you know, unbalanced and I'm down here when I should be, you know, like that, balanced, I know th some things that tends to tip me off. Um, right now, I'm in an awkward phase. I was in a job that I was pretty miserable um, in for the past 10 years, and being laid off was quite shocking for me. I mean, it was the best thing for me because it was very toxic. It was a very highly toxic environment. But um, also, um, the death of my dog. I mean, he's been with me most of my life. Um, I had him for 16 years. So all of my young adult years was spent with my dog. So um, losing him and right after getting laid off, um, pretty much, you know, you know. And recently, um, another thing that, you know, kind of, uh, tipped the scales again was hearing from an ex-boyfriend that came out of the woodwork after months and months of not hearing from him. Um, and basically, I was talking to my mentor about it, and um, she said, why are you thinking it's it must be something wrong with you? What if that other person is the one that's unhealthy and basically a sociopath? So I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know, you're right. He's not exactly a winner. Um, he's he's not a good guy, and I'm not gonna talk about him because I think that's immature, and um, I've I don't think it's worth my energy talking about him. So, um, but I know that's one thing that kind of triggered me. So if you know your triggers that will make you spiral, it kind of helps you to see, okay, I'm about to go, you know, like a balloon that's lost its helium and about to go to the ground. You need to know your triggers and how to quickly pick yourself up. And so um, for me, talking to my mentor, getting a little bit of support and encouragement and um, being introspective going home and thinking about everything and processing it and getting more feedback from you know especially from a male perspective is helpful um when it comes to other guys but um for me though being a type five all my life i excelled and achieved in school i was always on the honor roll and always in you know upper level classes and things like that so it became my safety net, um, especially when I lost my dad. And when I lost my complete family in one, you know, foul swoop when I was in the eighth grade, the only thing I had was education. And I made the honor roll even when he died. And then when I moved to Texas, they placed me in a few senior level classes, which was really intense and hard. And um, I remember this guy that was a sophomore was bragging to other people in the class that he was just a sophomore. And I saw the way he was treated. I didn't dare say, well, I'm just a freshman and I'm only such and such years old. I kept quiet, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, I just, I learned that education was safe for me. And so when, um, and I learned too, um, the other problem I have, um, my mentor said, sometimes I don't know how I'm coming across to people. I think I've worked extremely hard on social skills. I used to work in retail during my high school years as well as college. So 
I learned really quickly to come out of my shell and talk to people. Hi, how are you doing? You know, um, things like that made them feel good about themselves. And I had, um, they placed me as a young girl in a men's department with suits. And so I quickly had to learn to come out of my shell and approach guys and ask them how I could help them. And literally there would be a couple guys that would come in and say, I only want you, and they would have me follow them all around the store and help them with shoes, with everything. So literally, I would leave my department, had permission, and I would follow them all around the store to complete their entire ensemble from shoes, belts, undergarments, you name it, <laughs> socks. So they trusted my opinion, and um, it's hilarious because I'm a t-shirt and jeans kind of girl but of course I dressed for the role um, there but I wasn't like overdone like I would see other women with big chunky um, necklaces on I've never been that type I'm more um, subdued and laid back and don't like flashy things on me I don't like being the center of attention it makes me extremely nervous um, although I have had leadership positions where I had to be the center of attention, but when I saw that there was a goal behind it and it was for the greater good of the program, um, I was president of an organization in college called Psi Theta Rho. And um, when I first entered that uh, organization, I was just a freshman and there was only four people. And I went to the group and the president literally laid down the couch and took a nap. And we were just sitting around, and I'm like, um, so what are we going to do? And nobody had any ideas. And so the next year when they had, um, uh, and he was a senior, and he just wanted it on his transcript to look, you know, lovely that he was a president of an organization. So the next year when elections came around, someone suggested that I should um, be president. And at that same time, too, um, I was also... Um, uh, I became an RA or resident assistant for my dormitory and it was weird because it was girls my age and I was over them and they looked at me as if I was their mom, you know, away from home. So anyway, um, but I, yeah, I had to take care of my wing and make sure the maintenance things were taken care of, listen to their problems, their boyfriend issues and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but it didn't exactly pay the bills, so I didn't do that, but for one year. I did it for one year and then stopped doing it because it just, like I said, I wasn't paying the bills, so I went back to doing other types of jobs. So, but anyway, I, um, I became president and I grew that group from four people to 200 people. And how I did it is I just um, put flyers around and had organizational meetings where there was things of meaning. Um, I had people talk and discuss things. Um, I brought in speakers um, that had to do with the organization to talk to them about things. And um, parties, of course, where there's lots of food and get-togethers outside. And um, it was pretty easy, in my opinion. And then when I left the position the following year, uh, this guy elected himself and got voted in because nobody else wanted the position because <laughs> it was too many people. So his girlfriend talked him into making it exclusive and not making it so um, full range like I did. Um, I had let anybody that was interested in psychology, whether a major, minor, or um, undecided um, and taking electives, anybody who's interested in psychology, basically I encourage them to join so they can make up their mind, see if they want to go into that field, talk more about it, maybe um, understand themselves, um, because back then we were taking the Myers-Briggs and things like that. Um, so that girlfriend of that guy said we should make this exclusive and only people that are making straight A's should be in the organization so went from 200 back down to four people <laughs> and I had no interest in being in that organization at that point um, so I thought that was a shame but that's the only time that I felt it was important to be center of attention because I felt it was important to um, help people and rally them and make us all one in 
our goal in understanding the subject matter, having help, having other mates of various levels in the program help the other ones that are struggling um, in the subject, um, you know, things like that. So, um, but a majority of time, I don't like being the center of attention. I don't like it. It's, I don't like being stared at. I, I find that very unsettling because I'm like, what are they staring at? Is there something wrong with my appearance? What, why are they staring at me so hard? Why are they looking at me like that? What are they thinking? Did I do something awkward? Did I do something to make them stare? What did I do? You know, so my mind's going, you know, and I'm basically freaking out. Sometimes I just get annoyed. Like if they keep staring, um, I just like give them kind of, I'm sure that my look looks unfriendly. I'm sure I look rather angry. So um, they get the gist of it and leave me alone. But um, one of the things that ex-boyfriends complained about, which I have to take into mindset, because if one person complains about it, then you're like, nah, I kind of don't think he's right. But if there's two people that say the same thing, you kind of have to give it some thought and think, okay, maybe there's something to that because there's more than one person now saying the same thing. But what they would say is that I seem aloof and um, removed of emotion at times. And um, I think that that is where I'm very misunderstood because I feel a lot of emotion. Sometimes it's so intense and overwhelming that I'm just really trying to like go, you know, and gather which one and process it and process my thoughts and just calm down. And also I've learned to keep a cool head in crisis. So um, when they're blowing up and going off on me, I'm just like sitting there and going, you done? You know, and non-reactive. And I think they're used to girls screaming and yelling and shouting with them, and I just don't do that. So, um, there's very rare occasions where I will hulk out, but um, when I see that someone's deliberately trying to push my buttons and I don't see any um, use in reacting, and um, I, I just don't. I think, too, it has to do with how I grew up. I did grow up in an organization that was military in structure and um, very structured and 26 different people, you know, ordering me around and telling me what to do. And if you showed emotions, basically that was a weakness. I learned really quickly. So I learned not to do that. Also, I felt like if I was in control of my emotions when my superiors or my peers were not, it helped me to have some kind of locus of control and um, I would just go and be alone and um, get away from all that chaos. It, it helped me to just either go in my room or go outside and kick my soccer ball over and over and over, um, which, you know, I'm, I was pretty limited in things I was allowed to do, but thankfully I was allowed to do that. And when I was a senior, I was allowed to take walks. So I did that quite often. I, before um, losing my family, it, it, it was routine. I always walked. I always took walks. I had always walked home from school. Um, so it was weird to not be able to have that freedom anymore and um, have such a structured life. You have to get up at 6 a.m., da-da-da-da, chores, da-da-da, you know. Um, so it was quite different. So, um, but unfortunately, very few people understand that. Um, not to say I can't show emotions, I can, but I think um, the problem is, is sometimes I don't care, um, which I know I need to work on. Um, and for, for example, with that, um, co-workers that I felt were just gossipy, nonsensical, um, time wasters, when they invite me to things, I was like, is it worth the energy on my day off or my time off after work when I really need to replete my energy after working a full eight hour or 10 hour day? Is it worth hanging out with these losers that I really don't like that gossip about everybody, including me probably? 
or um, should I go home and watch Doctor Who? Uh, I think Doctor Who wins. So I became known as like um, a snobby, antisocial person, and it's not that. It's not like that. It's just, um, well, I guess so. You know, I just didn't see that they were worth my time or energy, and so um, they didn't like me for that reason. And so, and I did not care. I was like, I don't care. I I think that your um, drama and your gossip is a big waste of time, and I don't want any part of it. If you want to talk about something of more depth and meaning, or something interesting, or something where I'm going to learn something from you, and we can you know, bounce off each other, then you have my full attention. But if, you know, if, or if they had a problem, I do have enough compassion. If I saw one of them upset or they had a bad day, I would listen and give them feedback and encouragement. And um, then the next day they would just treat me like royal crap, I guess because I saw them in their weakness and they felt vulnerable. I don't know. I saw it. I, I grew to just get tired of it after 10 years of that kind of thing and being around those sorts of people. I just really grew tired of that. But um, I know I need to work on overcoming um, that part of me that goes, oh my God, I don't want to hang out with these people. I don't want to go to their stupid little um, karaoke get together. I don't want to have lunch with them. I'd rather have lunch by myself or I'd rather skip lunch and just work straight through so I can get off work earlier and go home and relax. So I think, um, and it's hard because I'm like, I'm not being my true self if I hang out with these people. I'm having to fake it, which requires more energy. So I have to work on that and it's, it sucks. I can't, I can't stand, um, those sorts of people. So as a type five, I know I have to work on that. Um, and I have to work on feeling like I have to perfect something and see it in my mind before I actually perform it. For example, music. I've performed before. People like my singing, but, um, I feel insecure. I don't like being watched. I'm like, what are they thinking? Um, oh no, I, I, um, I should have been, um, a half note and I made a whole note jump. Um, my rhythm was off. Um, I sounded sharp on that note, you know, um, I didn't take a long enough breath to sing through the whole phrase and you know just all this stuff is going through my head that most people aren't thinking about when I listen to the radio I hear them breathe through a word and can't even carry a phrase um, and the rhythm is off <laughs> and I'm like how is that on the radio how is a producer not catching that and making the singer redo it but um, for me, I, I, I can't stand that about myself. It has to be perfect, and I have to see that within myself before I can do it publicly. And it's crazy. I didn't used to be this um, intense about it. So I'm trying to just go, relax. People believe in you and like you. You need to believe in yourself. And that's my problem. I don't believe in myself. And that's the thing I need to work on is a type five and um, that's what's making me tick. I don't believe in myself and so I need to believe in myself so I can grow and get out there because if I don't get out there I'm not gonna grow and get over um, my anxieties with performance anxiety and all that sort of stuff. So, um, but yeah, education, I have overkilled on that. I have, but it's for me, it's been easier than relationships. It's safer than relationships. Um, uh, so, you know, going outside, being out in nature, easier than being around people and crowds. Um, and helps me to relax and feel like I'm my true self. So I, I hope that helps to explain why a type 5 is a type 5. I don't know if all people are like that across the board. I think we all have our differences and we have different things that make us tick but for me um, understanding something in my mind so that then I could feel confident to do it and believing myself and um, 
being my true self instead of being stifled um, and judged. I think that is what is the things that make me tick. And um, relationships, bad relationships has what's been my Achilles heel and made me spiral down in the past. Um, so it's a matter of picking healthier people and having the ones, like my mentor said, she's like, you're able to pick up on people very quickly. So it's a matter of when you attract these guys, because you're going to attract these guys that are unhealthy, just get them out of your life really quick. You know, don't waste time on them. So, and uh, she asked me why I um, got into these relationships. And I explained some of them are very persistent. Um, the one that was the unhealthiest um, was extremely persistent. We were neighbors and literally our doors were five feet away from each other. So when he broke up with me, so he could date um, this Hispanic girl, I started dating and he intimidated the guys that I was dating and did stuff to start fights with them. And um, one was scared he was gonna mess up his truck, he had a nice truck. So he just bluntly told me, I just, I can't date you anymore. I'm, I'm scared he's gonna screw up my truck and I just don't want the drama with him. So that sucked. So then I moved away from him to another apartment complex, but he knew where I went to church. So he moved to the apartment complex right behind my church and then kept going to my church and he would go to places he knew I frequented so I had to literally change everything I had to change churches I had to change where I used to frequent and then he hacked into my emails and my Facebook and I'm not gonna tell you how he was able to do that um, without knowing my password and finding out my password but um, basically he did that and he just was not gonna let go and he wanted his cake and eat it too. He wanted to keep me, but he also wanted his freedom to um, screw about with um, whatever woman he wanted. He was basically a player and a selfish one at that. And um, he liked me because um, I think I made him feel secure. And um, But he is just not a good person. Um, and I'm going to leave it at that, but that is primarily why I kept going back to him. And um, he also did things like um, what I went through um, with the organization that raised me. He broke me down so he can have control over me, and I don't agree with that. I don't believe in breaking down a person to control them. I think you get more out of a person if you encourage them and support them than if you break them down and um, I've learned that when a person does that and wants to control you it's because they're highly insecure and they know that um, they can't keep you in their life because um, I do deserve better than that person that I was dating um, he wasn't productive. He didn't have good goals. He had no goals for his life. Um, he still does nothing. He's very stagnant. So it was very toxic and very poisonous and um, good that I got out of it and good that I've kept my boundaries and stuck to my guns and said, no, I'm just not interested and I'm not going to continue to be used by you. You're going to have to find somebody else. So, um, relationships like that, um, that is a huge trigger and it makes me go, okay, I'm scared of people again and I withdraw. But there's so many good people out there. I met so many good ones at Comic-Con. Those movie stars I met, outstanding people, very down to earth, very similar to me. They're artistic and went into the, the arts and drama this, for the same reason I'm drawn to music and why I'm artsy, um, very similar to me, and I think that's why we click so well, and they're very intelligent people, um, so I just, um, I'm, I love that, and so I need to keep that in mind, in perspective, when the one person that's toxic tries to drag me down, there's so many more that are positive and good, so, um, hopefully that'll help other type fives to keep in perspective because yes there are a lot of scary people in this world sometimes i think i'm walking like a ghost amongst all these humans that are just hollow empty shells 
zombies, monstrous, and I just don't want to be around them. I'd rather be safe at home or like um, Simon Pegg's uh, thing with um, <laughs> um, Shaun of the Dead where his plan was just stay at the pub and wait out the zombie apocalypse. You know, I think that that is like a safe thing to do, but it's not very practical and you are going to watch life go by if you have that kind of plan. So I know I need to get out. It's just not comfortable to get out sometimes and it's scary. Like I said, it, it feels like I'm walking amongst zombies and hollow empty shelled people and um, it feels unsafe. I don't like them and I feel like I feel like prey amongst a pack of wolves and I don't like it. I don't like that feeling. Whereas education, I'm always the star pupil. People always want to sit next to me because I'm smart um, and they want my notes and want to know what it is that um, has helped me to excel and I teach them my tricks and um, help them as much as I can and I feel confident with that. And now I no longer have school. It's like time to grow up. No more grad school for you, Anna. You need to do something with your life. And um, the job that was toxic, no more of that too. You need to grow up and move on. That job wasn't good for you. Do something else. So, um, seeing things that feel like setbacks as a potential uh, opportunity to grow and do something positive and productive is how you need to reframe and move on is basically my advice for myself as well as for other people as I introspect and think and think think so that's what's in my mind and that's what's in my head and that's what it is to be a type 5 for me so I hope this helped somebody and again I will include the Enneagram uh, test free testing sites on this video if you look down where the comment section is so I hope you have a lovely day and I hope this helps you to be encouraged to understand yourself and other people and see where you need to grow so that you can not only be the best of yourself but more helpful for other people around you. Thank you and have a lovely day and thanks for your time.